It's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to another Thursday Swarm Lab seminar. Great to see a lot of different people here. Lots of visitors today, so this is really fun. It's been a good, uh, diverse crowd and continues that way. So thank you for coming. It is with great pleasure that after uh, a long time we are, have our friends from Cisco here today. Flavio has uh, been a good friend of ours for a long time. So let me do the, the intro for those of you who don't know Flavio. Flavio Bonami is a Cisco Fellow, Vice President, and head, is head of the Advanced Architecture and Research Organization at Cisco Systems in San Jose, California. He is co-leading the Vision and Technology Direction for Cisco's Internet of Things initiative. This broad Cisco-wide initiative encompasses major verticals, including energy, connected vehicle, and transportation, connected cities. In this role, with the support of his team, he is shaping a number of research and innovative efforts relating to mobility, security, communications, acceleration, distributed computing, and data management. Small portfolio. Before joining Cisco in 1999, Flavio was at AT&T Bell Labs between 1985 and 1995, with architecture and research responsibilities mostly relating to the evolution of the ATM technology. And then he was, then was principal architect at two Silicon Valley startups, ZeitNet and Stratum One. Flavio received a PhD in electrical engineering in 1985 and a master's of electrical engineering in 1981 from Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. He received his electrical engineering degree from Pavia University in Italy. So, I welcome. So, sorry, I should have sent the shorter version. Oh, no. We, it's always nice to get a full background on our speakers. Sorry, I so, one and no, no, no. I, I appreciate it. So, welcome. Thank you very much.
uh, the three pillars may be transportation in general, uh, industrial, automation, and uh, um, what is the other one? Uh, anyway, those are the uh, uh, and, and energy, the energy with smart grid and so forth. Big point: it's coming from two directions. This kind of perfect storm. One is from the cellular world, w which allows to connect more and more and connects phones and many other objects. And then the other one is the, the, the angle from the internet uh, IP networks. In the end, it's an extensive uh, exploding connectivity of all si type of objects. Small objects, cars, trains, uh, caterpillars, medical devices, it's all happening. And we see that because every industry is coming to visit us at this moment, to find out if we are doing something serious, but also to tell us their problems, their pain, their pain points. And they go from the oil and gas to the, the defense industry and so on. It's, it's a huge thing. One of the key points we, we are understanding and we want to make here is that uh, all these verticals are basically supported, could be supported by the common architecture, and many times a shareable infrastructure. Because we cannot go out and build parallel infrastructure for every vertical. <coughs> take the example of a building or take the example of a city. You cannot have lighting, uh, security control, and uh, uh, traffic, uh, and, 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 and cars, and so on. They have to share in a virtualized way. And this is really the, the convergence of technologies from the enterprise, service providers, and data center, and Cisco is positioned well. Not that that means that we will execute uh, as, as powerfully as we could, but, but we are in a good position. And the whole point is, what is this infrastructure? Is really the computer, distributed computer of the future, over which the applications, driven by and enabled by this connectivity of sensors and machines and so on, can be developed. And I'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, another big point here is uh, uh, the convergence of the industrial floor, you know, the, the IT piece, with the machine control piece. It needs to come together for many, many reasons, not only cost reduction, but it is happening, and that requires, again, the convergence of networks and technology that were very different, and they were using very different protocols than what we used to do in the, in the pure IT uh, area. So this is a, a big movement, and, and we'll see the consequence of that. You've probably seen this multiple times. These are the three domains where we are most active. Uh, JP is the other co-leader of this uh, effort at the architecture and technology, JP Vasseur. Probably you know him around here. He's leading a lot of the technology for the smart grid. I'm, uh, I brought a lot of this in, and then industrial automation developed as well. But many of the other areas will come together. So let's take a look at this at the high level uh, to this infrastructure story and the implications in, in terms of the wireless uh, uh, communication evolution. So first point is, uh, is this, this is the picture that we use a lot, but it tells you that there's this uh, uh, kind of hierarchy where you have your sensor, your, your swarms out here. The swarm is all these machines, little and big, connected with many technologies, wired and wireless, too the infrastructure. It could be a peer-to-peer -peer never connected. In some of the defense industry, you don't, don't have anything else. You are a swarm by itself. But in most cases, you need the support or you want the support of the infrastructure because you want to reach other resources and go in deep towards the cloud world out there. And in between, there's all the communications, the edge routing, the access points, uh, the home servers. And there's a lot in between. But this is the big picture. And the big question is, are we going to be supported by a picture like this in the future, where, which is the excitement of today, where you have a nice smartphones, and then the clouds, iCloud, Google, and Amazon.com. So to turn on a light here, you go to Amazon, and then come back and click nice. Is this the way you'll do applications in the future? Very likely not, because the clear direction, I think it, sorry, uh, there should be intelligence down here too, is a much more distributed uh, 
system because of many, many motivations, uh, and, you, and we'll go through some of those, uh, where you are seeing resources of computing and storage well embedded with networking coming down towards the swarm and into the endpoints too with some of the same paradigms of virtualization, security, real time, both in the networking and in the computing and storage. Because for scalability, survivability, I don't want to give you all the reasons, this is the way of the future. And so it's a world of distributed systems. And you are working well at that level. So uh, wireless is all over the place. And from down here, where you're working with the many of these low power wireless ad hoc techniques, but then you go deep, and then you have uh, various ways to connect to the infrastructure. And even between these layers, you might have satellite uh, um, communication, or you might have other ways that are wireless. For example, in the defense industry, the hierarchy is all mobile. So it's, it's, there's a lot of wireless and, and, and technologies here, like you know, here you see 60 and 80 gigahertz may be there. Wire and wireless, you don't have to be religious, you have to use what you need. And sometimes you have to use them simultaneously. And, and so there's a lot of networking, uh, mobility, all the things now come to the, to the fore because the demands are real. Uh, so there's a lot of communications uh, and there's a lot of technologies in that space. But now, the, the idea is, is represented here. So once we have this distributed uh, computing, we'd like to be able to develop the applications that are sitting and running in the back end, in the clouds, in the, in the endpoints, but also in between. And these are not the same application. They are component of the same uh, end result that you want to achieve, but they run in different places. And you want to have an appearance of your own network virtualized so that you feel you have your own infrastructure, but in reality, it's virtualized. And you have other pieces, other tenants sitting with you. This, in many ways, is learning from the cloud model, cloud computing model, and bringing it out towards the edge. This is where we are using the FOG term. Highly virtualized, much more real-time sensitive, on embedded devices, uh, br but in the same spirit of infrastructure as a platform, uh, virtualization so that you have multi-tenancy, so that you can now click your, P your uh, get your virtual machines and put your application on the same resources where someone else is already running their own applications. In a city, you can imagine parking automation and the monitoring uh, camera monitoring and so on, the, the water control and so on. They, they cannot justify many times to build their own infrastructure uh, for one vertical. The, it has to come out. So now the battles in cloud computing, uh, SDN, and uh, um, OpenStack, and all these nice stories happening down there have to come out in a much more complex environment that he's, has the wider network in between, mobility, and all the other things that are not now part of the discussion in the cloud. So from cloud, we learn a lot, but we want to bring it out in this most, more distributed system, uh, and, and, but in the same spirit. This is the goal. This is the, the, uh, the computer, the distributed computer over which the applications of the future will, will live. Now, why, now, a, a couple of uh, slides on more motivation. One of the key motivations is the data. <coughs> data movement, data management, and so on. Because why do we connect? We want to extract data. We want to extract information. And we want to push control logic down. So, uh, and again, the old model where you bring everybody, every, everything in the cloud doesn't work, doesn't scale. Suppose that you're monitoring a parking lot empty. Do you want to send all that high definition stream to a cloud to find out that it's an empty parking lot? Or you want to find out close to the edge that sh that information should not go up? So the information is ingested and the 
data awareness has to start from the sensors. You should be able to index or do something with the data, massage the data as it's produced. But then it has to be also potentially stored or analyzed close to the edge. And then, uh, particularly for streaming data or real-time uh, situations, you want to take action close to the edge. So you need to access the data and do things there. And then deeper inside, aggregation, correlation, and so on, have to happen. So until you get to the more batch behavior way back. So it has to be a hierarchical data management, hierarchical uh, analytics that, that has to work here. And this is important not only for the Internet of Things, but for a lot of other things in, in the space of big data. So this is the direction that Cisco has embraced. We had to bring them to understand that that's basically the role we can play, supporting not so much the analytics, but the data exposure, the data query, and so on. But we don't know what to ask. In most of these verticals, we don't know what to ask. But we should host those that know which questions to ask. So you, you got the idea, and the same is uh, now true. Look at this uh, other piece. In distributed control, again, we know, and this is particularly true from the, uh, uh, the case of the smart grid. You cannot drive the control from far away, one way. There's so much complexity now with energy coming in and out, cars pumping uh, energy into the batteries and uh, the, the uh, wind, wind turbines sending uh, their traffic in, their, their, not traffic, the energy in, that if you don't do a distributed control architecture here, you cannot live. And again, the ability to distribute computing storage is where you can host this, this uh, logic, this, uh, this control logic and control policies. So another reason is it has to be hierarchical control because the speed of reaction is, is going down, down as you go far away from that. And I know Jean knows these things very well. Different, diff, diff, different time frames, different time scales, and so on. The other one is the content. Content distribution is a completely uh, evolving beast. It's not Netflix coming down. It's now telematics from the car going up. It is software updates for the car going down. It is video monitoring coming up together with all the other things. So it's going in all directions. This is the, the current way. But there's the other way coming that is as probably going to be as big. And then there's also peer-to-peer, car-to-car that is happening. So again, if you don't have ways to extract the data, terminate and store and compute, not only communicate, but compute in a distributed way your, your host. So this is the example that probably uh, resonates here that, uh, that wants to kind of give you a, a little thing to remember. Uh, parking is a, is a beautiful use case because we're all suffering going around parking. In Paris, they tell me that a person that uh, works in Paris spends four years of their life looking for parking. <laughs> That's a statistic. So, and it's not particularly good time, we know. You know? And, and so solving this problem is a very, very important thing. We are working with a company in Foster City called Streetline, and they are using your technology developed here. And what is the, the story? We have PAX uh, sensors in the ground, and they do uh, light and, and magnetic kind of uh, measurements and so on. Then, and they have to live in the, uh, in the ground for 10 years, 10, 5, five 10 years. So you cannot really do a lot of expensive communication. You have to use dust in this case, to, and then you have to do it hop by hop, get, getting to a repeater up to this, which is an example of fog computing supported, supporting the analytics on the data that comes up, so that you don't send the analog data up to the cloud, but you send only the bits that say, I'm busy here and I'm not busy there. And you go to the portal where you have your database. And then you communicate to that with your application on the phone or the car to request a location, a position, or a reservation for that. You, you give it, set it up, and then give the map to reach there. This is a, an example of a company that was doing both the application and the infrastructure. But that doesn't scale. 
And we are trying to eradicate them from the infrastructure. Uh, not, it's, it's painful for the hardware guys there, but is allowing them to scale in a way that now they are a classic application on the infrastructure I talked to you about, and they are concentrating <laughs> on the application, on the business case, and so forth. But again, you, you see the case here of the need of a distributed intelligence and, uh, and of the, the, the decoupling between application uh, and infrastructure. This is uh, one of your pictures uh, that I think is very relevant here. Uh, they are companions. In your presentation down there, uh, you made that case. The cloud is that kind of more remote set of resources. Fog is what is in between, in a sense, more embedded, and then can come down. And then swarm is really the peripheral devices. But again, it's all foggy here. You know, things intertwine. You know, the bees go up as the fog comes down. Let's not make it, and I like this kind of paint type of boundaries. It's, you understand what we, what we talk about here. And the point is, applications have to run everywhere. They have to be coordinated. Security needs to be uh, coherent across the infrastructure. Content moves up and down, control policies, and so we need to work together. Big time. Every time we meet, there's a lot of love, and then uh, we don't follow up. We, we should send you money also to, uh, to help with that. Yes, yes. So now I have a few slides. We could go into the use cases, some of which are really happening around us. Uh, but I wanted just to give you the flavor that that infrastructure, and maybe when you understand that is kind of what the story is, you don't need to kind of repeat it too much. But the, the fact that we understood that smart grid basically has an infrastructure that is similar to other things that I'll show you. You have the end devices here, the field area network with the, its substations that are also computing. And, and in fact, now we're trying to put more and more computing into those objects at the edge, the GCR 1000, uh, and then more in the core, and then you go to the clouds. Again, technologies for communication, computing, storage, and so on are happening here. So this is uh, uh, just an introduction to what's going on on the transportation. There's a, it's probably one of the biggest verticals happening because Things need to be connected. Trains, there's a positive train control effort. 50 billion on the table. A lot of communication. There is a fleet kind of management. In China in particular, they are putting video. And, and, and in India, they want to put cameras everywhere because of some of the bad things that may happen on buses. But there's a, there's a lot of management of those resources needed. Connected vehicle is accelerating even faster than what we expected. Uh, and, and there's a lot of the, the connectivity between uh, the objects in motion and the infrastructure for traffic control and protection from accidents and so on. The, and, and planes are coming. GE is talking about the mess that is happening in the airports where you move with all this stuff and the amount of time it takes. Did you know that most of the time delay between a landing and the next departure is in data management, data collection, data uh, you know, unloading and loading? on the plane. It's not the mechanical, it's not the fuel, and so on. So if we have better communication techniques to extract this data quickly as the plane arrives, we could have a better situation in our question. Yeah. So uh, what kind of data is out of curiosity? Is the flight data, the end, the end to all the telematics of the state of the, of the systems? So it's more the protocol, right? That, that <coughs> And usually they, they take they that box. They, they the take box. it out and they walk out and they unload it. They have to analyze it. And, and, and there's another nice exercise. This is for uh, Formula One. Uh, because of security reasons, they want to go there to put in a, an Ethernet cable in the, in the car. And that can only be done by rolling the car back into the pit, into the, into the box. We are working with one of these companies dear to me. In fact, I'm working with the two enemies, McLaren and Ferrari as well. But so I, they, they are friendly, but they don't 
they don't get along very well. But the issue is, if you're able to have wireless communication to the car so that as you come close to the pit, you can extract securely with a VPN type of technology, the data, you can save a lot of time and be more competitive. I thought it was illegal to do that. In Formula One, you cannot have wireless communications with the cars. Well, no, in race, in the race. Okay. This is in the race. This is basically during. Dur during the during test and so on, you can do it. But in the race, in fact, we're working with the McLaren guys that have their own uh, the standard way to communicate with the cars, and you have to tell by, by voice to the pilot what to do. You cannot do automatic, automatic control. So anyway, uh, let's move on quick. So the connected vehicle is, uh, is here. Connected vehicle picture is, again, not an entertainment story. It's not infotainment. It's all that is going on inside the car, in the internals of the car, between cars, uh, obviously car and the, the tablets you bring in and other stuff. But then there is the charging uh, story that is happening now. You, you can charge as you move on certain uh, uh, lanes uh, or, or standing over a platform instead of having to plug in. So we are involved with the Department of Energy in, in a, one of those projects that is using actually 11P, which is the car-to-car -car communication, to keep the alignment between the car and the and the charging infrastructure there. But there's so many things happening together, and they have to be together because uh, you need to communicate so much, as much as you can, and as uh, cheaply as you can. If you just use 3G or 4G, you're, you're going to be limited in what you can do, particularly in Europe where there's all these uh, charges, roaming charges, that are bringing the application. BMW is desperate because if, you, if the guy goes around and they have to pay for the bill, uh, which is the case, they, don't, they, they cannot afford. So there's a lot of ways to, for example, I believe it will happen at traffic lights. And you come close, and there you have a small cell or you have a Wi-Fi hotspot, and you do a lot there. And then the content by itself will move up towards the destination. And the same, you go there and say, do you have my software update, or at least a piece of it. Then you absorb it and move on. Or you talk to the, the other car, BMW, that has, oh, you have piece three, I have piece four, I'll give it to you. So these things are fundamental. Car, I don't want to dwell on this huge transformation. Yeah, question? Uh, so the car is a spaghetti architecture in there. Insecure, messy, development of applications for controlling the car is the long pole for the development of, of vehicles. And we are working uh, to help fix this problem in the sense of a more rational network based on Ethernet, deterministic Ethernet in particular, with a partner called TT Tech, Masters of Timing Distribution, and consolidation of a, lots of ECUs into fewer ECUs, virtualized, powerful ECUs. McLaren told me in the McLaren race car, there's one ECU against 100 ECUs in a typical BMW high-end. Because it's a, now it's a data center. It's a cloud, the cloud inside or the fog inside the car. So if you are able to, and this is, by the way, a big direction in machine control is, is the decoupling of the software from the hardware. So you, the, your control might move a step away from where the machine is. And... And that's the, that's the SDN, SD, not N, SD, software defined. But you have to have a network that is deterministic in between, and you have to know how to virtualize your resource. So you, are you saying that you can actually merge all control functionality with anything else like data management, data communications? So, yes. Consolidate. We are not there yet. Okay. But... If you are able to, if you are able to virtualize security, well, you have first one. One step is physical virtualization. You might have multi, multiple cores that do different things, versus re replicating the whole the whole thing. Then you might, when you trust security and virtualization in the real real way, and you will have redundancy anyway. You can now start bringing things together into the same. Maybe in the beginning, it's communications and entertainment, communication and entertainment and car-to-car -car communications, and so forth. But it's, the movement is that. Uh, and, and then in each application, you'll decide where, how far you can trust. 
We are not there, and I would not trust us at Cisco to do it for you <coughs> yet. Okay? So let's go forward. So there's a, cities are another big, big area where everything comes together, from health to water to transportation, lighting, and so on. And this is a big, is a big deal. Okay, let's go forward to the, some of the discussion of enabling technologies here. So, at the communication level, there's a lot we can do better. Uh, the optimization, efficiency, robustness over, over wireless, uh, the good handling of heterogeneous systems uh, of communication together, maybe sometimes wired and wireless, or multiple wireless. I think you are in a good position here. Uh, and then move towards determinism, both at the uh, wired level and at the wireless level. The wired, I think we are a step ahead, but we are starting to see the movement on the wireless side, and we'll talk more about that. Because those systems appear in, in industrial floors and robots, uh, you cannot get this cable going back and with your machine. It has to be wireless. Uh, at the architecture level, uh, seamless mobility, we don't have it yet. You know, you, you think you're we are great. Either you're stuck to your service provider or you're in the wireless space, but in between uh, is not seamless. It's not happening. Uh, we do a little bit. But there's a lot more to do. Uh, content distribution is, uh, is critical, and we are not there. And, and then really realize the value of this uh, availability of this computing and storage resources. And then at the application level, the experience, uh, the support of control, critical control system, and then creating this ecosystem of partners that develop applications on the, on the infrastructure. There's a lot of goals here. Now, again, there's a lot of, of topics that I'd like to bring to you, including low power networking that is Something you know a little bit, the work we did at IETF with JP mostly. I was not planning to talk about that because probably you're aware of what we're doing there. Other topics down here, you know, security, I always leave it to someone else. So I, would, I'm, I have material, but I'm not going to talk to you today unless I bring the, the experts. But it's a, it's a big deal. And I, and I tell you, we are active on that. Not me as much, but we are active on that. So I was planning to talk uh, about this subset of the topics. Uh, in particular, you know, and I hope, I hope that that's, that's okay. But, uh, otherwise, we could, uh, we could uh, change the plan and, and, and go on. So for computing, I think uh, you know what we mean at this point. I don't want to dwell on that too much. But the idea is, uh, is really not pure edge networking, or say, or bringing a server to the edge. Here there's a new set of things. First, the real time. It, you have to bring the real time and no real time together. You're working on embedded systems, and this is not available. On the current uh, computers, no ARM or, uh, I think it's mine probably in the, in the list. ARM and even the Atom uh, system from Intel are not ready for the right level of virtualization. The integration with, the, the integration with networking the, uh, and, and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the other co-processing, graphics and other stuff. So it's different. It's, co it's parallel to what we do in the cloud, but it has many different connotations <laughs> that need special attention. But it's basically systematic, highly virtualized, secure, Network integrated computing and storage located between endpoints and clouds. But supporting some of the same techniques that we've been developing in the last years for the cloud. So that we can do this fully virtualized, fully multi tenancy system that we are talking about. So does it live in that box? Or in the yeah, that begins there. Both? Exactly. In fact, there will be a, a processor in here. There will be, there's already two core processors, and we know how to do. Extraction of the data, indexing and searching, so storage there. Now, this, we can do it on, the, on that processor. But you, now you go deep, I'll show you some more. You go deeper and maybe now at, the, at the, play, the controller, where the controller is, you might have more resources and then you go deeper. And now you have to know where the resources are 
and what to do at each place. So that AP right there, if you pick it out and from, from the bottom, there's actually a, a slot for a module. And we've been doing some research on what to fit in there. We could put another uh, CPU uh, to do virtualization or LTE. Yeah. That we can have. And so he has been actually designing that machine. But beyond, so this, this distribution of resources uh, is complementing the cloud. There's no con contention that cloud computing is going to be here to stay and we'll be using it more. But there's many more use cases than what I've been kind of uh, suggesting here, which go to touch the current IT world. And we're starting to see that. Networking is going to software. We know that. Its functions are performed in software. And now, where do you run software? You need computing. You need storage around the network. This is the SDN pressure is happening. The uh, entertainment, gaming of the future requires that you don't run it from the cloud. And you cannot run it from the device. The device will never catch up with the, the needs that gaming is putting on, on the graphics. So, uh, and social networking may be totally supported by that. Personal computing, all this, we know this, all this uh, augmented reality and many other uh, situations where you have sensors and, and the audio and other things all supported by a local set of resources. We're talking about, uh, this is not related, but the very interesting situations with the hearing aids. So if you have good, powerful computing, you could do amazing things with your hearing aids locally so that if I'm talking to you, I can erase the other traffic you know, in, in a restaurant, for example. We are screaming desperately to our wives across the table, and we could have something that erases the other traffic because you know where you're looking. This is beamforming for audio. And, uh, and the same with, uh, we'll see other things in the wireless. Uh, big data architecture in general and this thing or the IoT, so critical stuff. This is happening. Uh, is, is, uh, we see it from every side. It's going to be deploying and deployed in some ways, but more expansive. So we need to be prepared to this new world of distributed computing and storage. Now, uh, here uh, I wanted to show you some of the products that cover this, this uh, movement. First from the edge, obviously you have CPUs in your sensors and swarm. Then you go in, you have access devices. These are the, the APs we talk about. This is an edge router, the ruggedized that we produce called the 819. This is the smart grid box that has a, a, a dual core atom in there and will have slots for computing. This is a bigger set that has a, a, an x86 blade and, and this is another one we deploy in China. But the, you give, the, the idea is networking by itself will not live. It will be, in fact, net routing will be an application on the same computer. And then you go towards the next level and you need modular availability of these things, scalable. This is on a, on a train, on a, an oil rig, on a roadside box for, uh, for traffic lights, you need to add more of those resources, this is a little data center in a box. And then you go in deeper in the network and you start bringing down the servers towards a more distributed picture. So this is an idea of where we want to go and where we are going. And now the question is not to put the hardware down, is how to manage it in a, in a successful way so that remotely you go down and say, oh, I have, I have an application to go here, pack. You put it down. Do I need another little fog uh, node? Tuck. You, you turn it on. So this, uh, I'll skip this, but the idea, this is an old design from 2009. It tells you the type of microservers that are, are needed there, uh, where you have embedded computing, graphics processing, network processing coming together in compact form factors. Uh, 50 watts, very little money, and modular. So this is, for example, 40 cores and 20 graphics processors in a little box, 500 watts, powerful. And that can help you, can help your devices and so forth. So 
a few use cases we've been exploring. This is what we explored with, the, with the Intel, uh, where you, you might want to have a Fox server close to the edge to optimize the delivery of video in the last uh, wireless uh, hop and do adaptive streaming here and so forth. All right, so this is the fir first example. The second one is the, the roadside computing in these boxes. Uh, you, you now uh, approach this, the, the traffic light. You can do, as we said, communications, content exchange, the coordination of the approach to the traffic light, and the camera monitoring that is always there. You can do the analytics at the edge. This is another example that may be relevant to you. I, I'm kind of uh, copying it from Cost, Costas Psunis and, and the people from USC. Uh, they're doing uh, uh, multi-user MIME, distributed multi-user MIMO. Doug brought them to, to us recently. They're good collaborators. But again, if you look at what they're trying to do here, is they are trying to uh, coordinate the communication from multiple access points to specific users by, uh, by deciding um, how to really create the, the, the right uh, uh, stream uh, to, the, the, to the right uh, receiver here. And it needs good processing that has to be coordinated and cannot be in each access point. It has to be one step removed. Typical application for fog computing there. In fact, here is the case. And now you might have multiple access points that give you multiple antennas that now you can coordinate. More than the limited four that you have there, you might have uh, hundreds of antennas or, or tens of antennas that now you can work with. And again, uh, timing, and you see here, here, timing, synchronization is fundamental to do these things. And this is already good. That's part of radio LTE. This is going to do some very similar type of things. Yeah. So that, that's true, but the, the, you get, you get, you get the, uh, the motivation here. Now, if you have more computing, you can do even better things. So, and you can gain uh, traction here. This is someone you know, and uh, I, you know, I took one of your slides, took away the nice brown in the back, uh, and the point is your connectivity broker, we need to talk, but the idea that you have a coordination of all the resources, optimization of all the resources through multiple uh, uh, wireless technologies at the same time could reside, could be hosted uh, close to the edge and could give you the ability to, to do more. And, and we bought a company recently, Meraki, uh, that is starting to use a controller that is in the cloud, actually. So if you want to say a few things about that, um, or maybe we don't. So, but th there is this, this ability to move the control of the wireless environment to the cloud in their case, but you could put it on the fog even more effectively. I think it's, it's good that we're moving towards um, that paradigm. Um, typically, right now, with Cisco cells, before the Meraki acquisition is uh, near the edge, all of these access points would connect to a controller. That controller is another. Exactly. And again, this is because we only have this paradigm that everything is either in the cloud, so that you turn on your light from Amazon, uh, go to Amazon to turn on a light, and then at the end point. Here, if you have find resources close by, you don't need to go all the way to the cloud. And your virtual machine that controls that edge situation will be, will be there, cluck. And, uh, and again, uh, a lot of potential there for what we are doing together. Now, this one I don't understand fully because I've not been part of your work, but I believe that the Fog OS, in fact, we, we'll, we didn't go into what we are doing there, and, uh, and your, your swarm, OS, swarm OS may have something to share or something in common. Or maybe we can run your swarm OS on the, on the fog and, uh, and see what we can do. So 
uh, I think that this is a proposition for collaboration. We'll come up with the money, and then we'll work together on this. So, <laughs> Lisp, uh, how much time do, you, do I still have? Am I already at the end? Two minutes. Wow, 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 wow. You can go for another 10. Give me 10. 15? Yeah. All right. <laughs> I, we came from a long... It's real time. Okay. So, this one, I don't know if you know, but... Uh, this is, a, this is a way to, uh, to support mobility uh, that is called uh, Location uh, Identity Separation Protocol. Basically, I thought it, was a programming. it used to be, and you know, it still is, but th this is a new way. So th I'll go into that because it's important both for the realization of uh, the fog computing end-to-end, fog computing including cloud, fog, and so on. And because I think it's important that we support mobility in a better way than what we do now. Uh, so the, the idea is that you now use two addresses. One is the location address. The other one is the ID. So that your TCP connection is linked to your I idea, uh, identity, but the location may move as you go from point to point. Uh, and this is a way to really decouple that con contradiction that your identity and your location are mixed in one address. And this has a lot of potential in terms of supporting mobility, multi-home, different stacks, and network mobility, where you, the whole car moves with all its sensors, with all its addresses, and only one uh, address changes, because it's common uh, to all of them. All of them maintain their identity, but the location for all of them has changed. And uh, this is a, a simple, obviously you, re, you require a mapper that maintains the information about where you're going. So that if you want to communicate, you really know, need to continue to tell where you are. From, from Wi-Fi to 3G means that your ad location changes. It's informed up to the mapper, uh, to the, to the, the mapper and then these, these endpoints, sorry, uh, finds out your new address and communicates to you, reaches you into the new network. So this infrastructure element could live on this distributed computing uh, platform we're talking about, and it's, it's being deployed pretty vastly, pretty broadly right now. But th there's another implication, which is the, resor the fog resources, the virtual machines move. <coughs> because now, as you might need to process at the edge, you see in this case, uh, the, the, vir the virtual machine moves to the edge, and, and again, the connection between these, uh, these, uh, all these elements, the moving endpoint, the virtual machine, the data, needs to be managed in, in this form. So it's a very promising technology. Uh, it's a little bit too tight. I don't want to kind of spend time on the, on the detail. By the way, the BART is going to use LISP. Uh, as you know, we have Wi-Fi on the BART. We're working with, uh, with Wi-Fi rail. And they're using a layer two protocol right now that does a, the handover. We are going to use um, uh, Lisp in the future. And by the way, this technology is the one used now by McLaren in Formula One, so that you go from access point to access point around, around the, the, the race course. Okay, uh, I want to spend a little time on this topic that is very important. So uh, we all have to really move for, an, oh, for a number of reasons uh, given here to a more deterministic, reliable network where you really need to make sure not so much the latency but the jitter that is, is reduced. And then you really get the, the packet. So the key elements to get there are controlling the in ingress of the traffic, uh, fundamental distribution of timing so that everybody knows exactly the absolute time. Uh, uh, retrans uh, transmission at the, at the right time, so you have to insert the packets before other stuff. And centralized static or dynamic scheduling, which doesn't scale to great levels, but there's ways to do it. At least in, re in, in, uh, in a car or in, in an industrial floor, you can do it in a, you're smiling. Well, it's just JP just used to shoot me down regularly On this. in Cisco meetings by saying centralized will never work. But he's now buying into this. <laughs> so we, we are bringing him back. So, you know, Cisco always was 
this is the mantra. Oh. And then now we see that things work in a centralized way with, a, with, a, with a SDN and so on. So it's a, it's a lost battle. You have to use whatever is best. And in this case, you need some, some centralization. Uh, Trigger, uh, time triggered Ethernet is now moving forward, and we're trying to make it a standard with a t t Tech in Vienna. And then we are working on the uh, wireless uh, in, the, in a number of uh, uh, bodies and bringing the, some of the same elements into the wireless. And so this is basically the movement with, uh, uh, with t t Tech in the Ethernet domain. Uh, and the idea is really that you transmit in certain time slots. And then, now we are trying to bring it to layer three, and there's work in IETF driven by one of my employees, Pascal, you probably know Pascal. There's Xavi here, is Xavi here? Hey, Pascal is working with uh, Xavi, and sends greetings. He reports to me, and he's a very good guy driving a lot of these topics. Uh, this is, these are his slides. This is, I don't think it's a very nice name, Sixtish, but uh, uh, is the, Sixtus. The St. Sixtus Brewery. Oh, oh, okay. But anyway, bring in some of the same principles of the time slot and the synchronization and so to the, to the layer three. Uh, here, what I, I want to say about this is we need to handle multiple paths in a seamless way, in a car or in a Many ways, when you don't have enough bandwidth, you really need to gang, gang together multiple, multiple paths. And we are not that good at connection management. And, and this is one of the things that connected vehicle requires. And, and this is very important beyond it. And, in, and, and the, the issue of multipathing is very, very delicate because even if you're able to use them, how do you distribute the traffic? If you, use, if you do it by flow, you don't get as much efficient. If you do it by packet, you can do even worse if one of the links is lower, because now you're waiting for packets that are supposed to come from the other one. We believe that network coding may have a very powerful in, input in, uh, impact into this, because now you send the stuff, the order is not as important, and we saw some of the work from uh, MIT, from Muriel Medar there, that is seeing some of the advantages there. But we are, we are doing more, and we'll come back with some more results, in fact, uh, we are working with, uh, with uh, Raymond Young in, uh, in uh, Hong Kong, and, and Doug is the, the driver of that work. So I'll skip this topic. Optimization is very important as well. Uh, how many minutes I'm left with? Um, real time, seven and a half. Oh, okay. So <laughs> real time? So let's talk about this a little bit. You, you guys have been talking about this and working on, on these topics for, for a long time. And I think now the use cases are coming, not only in the military space, where this has been always important, but in a lot of deployments, industrial transportation, and so forth. So let's see a few, uh, a few things that are happening here. First, we need to enable a more natural way of collaboration, collaborating and socializing. And uh, there's a number of things that you're looking at. We need to have that happen. We need to also get the stronghold of the operating companies uh, that has been also blocking this, that even tethering and other things were been limited by their, uh, by their interest. So we need to do that. Uh, highly mobile exchanges need this type of uh, uh, ad hoc, but also delay tolerant communication. Uh, Many, many applications, transportation is fundamental. We cannot maintain, and also this data exchange, we cannot do it on a connectivity, end-to-end -end connectivity basis. We have to send it out, let it go by itself. We need to do this uh, in a new way. Collaboration when the core connectivity is available uh, opportunistically. And uh, again, so there's a lot more stuff that we need to do in this space. And, uh, and this is happening at the periphery of the fixed infrastructure. So here, Mane and so forth. I think this one I want to, this is from, uh, uh, I'll, I'll go beyond this. So this is a picture from, uh, uh, from uh, actually Pascal, where we are looking at using Lisp in the core and then using this Ripple protocol you probably know very well 
uh, at the periphery so that we can do this multi-hop uh, uh, DAG-based uh, uh, technology that, that we push through the, uh, the IETF. Uh, and I think it's, it's ready for deployment. It's deployed in some cases. Maybe we have kind of different, some people think they're still too power hungry. But, uh, but it's, you were part of that work. Yeah. So this is a very important piece. And it, it is finding application in the car space as well. Not only the little objects, but the car. And here is the other one that is, uh, uh, we invested in is the DSRC that has been kind of lingering for years, but uh, it's, uh, now we have uh, things happening. And in Porto also, we are, we are working with the University of, of Porto where they have taxis communicating through this, not just the, the safety, but also data. And, and they are getting very good throughputs in that model that is described here. Uh, so this is the deployment in Porto where uh, cars talk to each other and some of them have access to the infrastructure with 11P or they can communicate to the bus that has actually 11G and AC and cellular. So now uh, you can imagine on the highways cars that talk to each other and then find the, the access point. And, and we've shown that you can have very powerful throughputs in this model. So other things, I think you, you've seen, this is the work from uh, our, our partners at USC and UCLA. This is, the last thing I want to dwell on is the uh, more powerful collaborative ad hoc networks that are used now in the defense industry. Uh, Persistent Systems has a, has a Wi-Fi based uh, technology that is very robust and powerful. Expensive, obviously, when you buy these objects. But we are going to OEM it and start seeing uh, how it uh, deploys in, in transportation. And this has, uh, has been used successfully in the uh, recent storm in the East Coast. They've been very, very busy there, uh, and it's, uh, it's very, very powerful. Uh, persistent system, check them out. And uh, so it's military, but also uh, uh, disaster relief. Conclusions, uh, I think, is a great, is a great exciting time uh, to, to work together. There's a lot of uh, uh, new innovations needed. We need you, in particular. You're the right you're guys. You saw it coming probably most uh, better than everybody, anybody. And you stayed on it, some, you know, uh, successfully. And, uh, and there's a lot of fun to be had, you know, with proof of concepts, in domains that are very close to our lives. Uh, for me, car and networking came together in a beautiful way. It's fun. I don't have enough time to, to, to go and, and have fun with them. But uh, uh, So this is my story. Any questions, uh, if, uh, if there are? being developed that have components in the cloud and in the fog and down on the, you know, the leaf level? I mean, how would a developer design something like that? So I, I think the, the, the first example is what we have done with, the, with parking. They, they have to kind of solve their problem. They, they have to understand how the problem is solved in a, an isolated model. And then we have to provide them an environment, containers for their application, the management of the resources, the virtualization of the network, so that they can feel like they do in the cloud. Now, you go in to Amazon and you get storage in this point. In that case, storage is, is in Amazon. Uh, you know, you get these many machines, virtual machines, and then you start running it. Here, it's more resources and this non-homogeneous. And minimally, you can say, okay, I need uh, embedded virtual machines here and virtual machines in the core, and then you have your own sensor. Usually, the sensors are your own specific sensors. And now, you, 
bring the software down that runs this thing. We should help you on that. So you start up the virtual machines, and you start communicating, and then you start seeing the data coming to you. It goes back there. Now, what languages, what kind of containers, and so on, we are looking at various things from, from the Java to the Linux containers to more traditional uh, environments. Uh, but so we'll, we are starting to see some of those examples. We have some products that are using Python to, to, uh, to do the, the, the coding over some of our edge routers. But and these are shipping. They're called connect, uh, cloud connectors. They are not doing uh, everything we want to do here. The, the virtualization is not fully there. But some exercises are, are there, mostly with friendly customers, where you sell them the box, and then you tell them, you know, this is the way you put your application on top. Usually they own the infrastructure. Having a public or shared infrastructure, we are not there yet. So a lot of the story relies on, on, on the, the heterogeneous networking model, right? So uh, definitely the smart city thing, you have uh, infrastructure, you have ad hoc networks, point-to-point uh, -point networks. How is it all coming together from a business perspective? There's a bunch of barriers right now that prevent us from this to happen. So what do you think is going to make it happen? I think that uh, there should be an infrastructure player, hopefully Cisco, that starts being a mediator in, in some of those spaces. Or it could be a service provider. You know, one of them was down there uh, the other day, two of them. And I think that one of them with a V uh, yeah. is, is moving a little faster. They're already talking about the, uh, the ecosystem. They have, are creating an ecosystem of application developers. And, and then they start exposing certain ways to bring their, the sensors in, in a city, for example, and into their edge fog elements, which they are embracing uh, powerfully. And they would be the, the kind of in-between. Or in the future, there could be another way where uh, it's, all the services are given as a service, uh, as a outsourced, for example. Parking, lighting, and so on is not deployed by the government of the city, the administration. But someone comes there and says, okay, you give me a cut of your parking money, and this, and I'll maintain, manage, and so on. So this is a model that is happening in some places. They have to solve a lot of these issues, but they own the infrastructure. They have their, their ecosystem of partners, and then they offer the portfolio to the city that, that this is happening in some places, but uh, they just tell you, you know, th what, this is what we can offer you, and there's a package deal, and, and this is happening in the, in the car. They, they're telling me that uh, car companies are ready to outsource the plants. Say, okay, I'll pay you so much for, car, for each car. This is the design, and someone builds, maintains the plant, puts down the machines, and pop. So this, is, this model is going to be powerful. It's at least uh, surfacing. Uh, so the uh, the it's true they they don't want it to be fully standard some of, but uh, on the on the mobile IP yeah, so the resistance was mostly the fact that if you can now reach multiple networks nicely and flexibly you are not owned by AT and T and this this has been resolved now because there's a virtualization of the of the SIM card that allows you now to choose which network you're associating with. This is, we, by the way, we had a patent that was rejected internally. And then three years later, Apple did that same thing. And they paid a billion, a billion euro not to use it in Europe. 
But now it's out there. So now there was a, the mobile wireless, there was a, a, a demonstration that you can now have a phone that in software chooses which network you're associating with. So that is starting to break the mold. But now you need this flat IP model. And mobile IP before is kind of old and stiff and, and rigid, is not scaling well. IP, mobile IPv6 has problems. Uh, Lisp is a standard, is an ITF, but it's associated too much to Cisco. Juniper li doesn't like it, so it says, oh, it's only Cisco. But it's one other solution. We believe it's the best for that, for that space, but there's some resistance, although it's, it's getting deployed. Uh, but standards have been limited and slowed down by some of the big interests as well. So, but we need to go to standards in all these efforts. The deterministic internet has to come not from TT Tech, but it has to come from IEEE. The same with the wireless. We have been always in the forefront of making things standard. After we are kind of the de facto standard, usually. That would be the best case. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Any other questions? I think you skipped the security part. I was wondering if you could talk about, uh, I mean, in this entire presentation, uh, we didn't quite touch the, the security, privacy, identity kind of issues. So that, that's I said before that I usually bring other people to talk about that. Uh, usually, uh, so this is a very, very powerful uh, topic. Uh, it is not only the, the access into the network, but also the security of the data, uh, because uh, it's, not the, it's not protecting the links, it's protecting the objects that go around the links. So there's, there's effort in that way. Obviously, we will go, are going to use all the elements of uh, security we develop for the network from uh, intrusion detection, encryption, VPNs, and so on. But that's not sufficient. Uh, the 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 other one is the uh, the uh, anonymity and and uh, obfuscation. That's very very important here. Uh, but again, it depends on the application. In some cases, you want to be known because you can gain uh, control and protection from accidents and other things. But uh, in some other case, and by the way, we are already known. They all know where we are, you know, with the phones and with Google. Uh, you know, privacy is gone already in a sense. So we have to kind of w rewind it, but uh, absolutely, we are, we are known. And if the government needs to know, uh, you know, you could have one of those planes in Afghanistan that out of a thousand or a hundred thousand people spots your communication. If you saw the movie, you saw the movie on, on Osama, uh, what's happening. The communication from the guy to his mother was captured from the sky. So, yeah, it's a big topic and I'm not uh, the right person to talk to you about. We'll bring uh, Nancy and another person that works with me on this and give you a better a better story. Sorry, if you came for security, you are disappointed. But it's critical. And the point is, we were talking here. We are already with you. We are already down beyond the, the level of comfort, you know, in cars and so on. You can already stop a GM car on the, in the middle of the road by hacking into the uh, OnStar data center. Yes. So we are... Yeah, so, but, but, but we are down, and the cars, the, you know, the, the networking cars doesn't even have a source address. So once you get into the car through the wireless uh, sensor in the tires, you can make anything happen. You can start the car. Yeah. It's happening. Right. That would be really good to have someone come back and talk about security, because yes. just as with you, we talk about it, and it, it's... A, Incredibly important area. It Absolutely. Needs, needs focus, and I think that would be a, a really good Yeah, I'll, actually, let's follow up with the yeah. team. We'll, uh, we'll, uh, I'll bring back the, uh, the, the, the security group. That would be really, really good. Okay. Thanks. Let's, uh, let's thank Flavio again.